Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In the last lesson of this week, we will study about uh, is higher education a public good or a quasi-public good or a merit good. Now, let me give you a context to why this discussion is important. If you recall, in the first uh, week as well as in a few lessons succeeding the first week, we, when discussing about uh, the theory of human capital or looking at education as investment uh, in human capital, we raised the question about is higher education a commodity? And what does uh, it mean when we say that while higher education is a commodity, we are also looking at it as a unique economic good? And uh, a part of that question we will be answering in today's class. Now, uh, you will also recall that in this week, we have taken up two major issues in the context of um, public sector intervention or government intervention in uh, unique goods such as education or health. We started discussing about the role of the public sector, why a public sector is important uh, when we talk about provisioning uh, goods such as education and health which has huge uh, externalities, positive externalities for the society as a whole. And in so doing, we uh, realized that uh, possibly the market may fail to provide some of these goods and services as a result of which a political process of people's participation through the budgetary process is required to be able to provide many of these uh, resources or many of these goods and services. And in so doing, we looked at allocation, distribution and stabilization functions of the budgetary process. And we also uh, looked at the concept of public goods. and. And while uh, discussing the concept of public goods, we distinguished it from uh, the concept of private goods, uh, merit goods and we also looked at the concept of externalities, how do externalities arise, uh, there are negative externalities, there are positive externalities and we also looked at different methods of correction of these externalities. But there is one uh, important uh, thing in this entire discussion which was that the government intervention in correction of externalities arising uh, in the case of public goods was uh, highlighted as very important. So, it is in this backdrop that we need to carry out today's discussion on is higher education a public good or a quasi-public good or a merit good and there are uh, extensive debates in uh, that surround this question and hopefully we will be able to answer a few questions, uh, address a few of these issues today. So, the outline of today's lesson is as follows, we will first try and understand how do we classify higher education. We will uh, address the issues surrounding higher education and the merit good debate. Uh, I will also uh, familiarize the learners with the concept of commoditization of higher education uh, and then uh, we will end today's lesson by uh, going through some of the theoretical frameworks in economics that address the issue of financing in education. Now, let us uh, begin with this uh, question about uh, what kind of a good is education? Can education be considered as a private good? Now, understand that you know education can be at various levels and layers. Uh, there are primary, secondary and tertiary education. But if we have to pose this generic question about uh, where should we place education as far as uh, an economic good is concerned or a, or a commodity is concerned, then we will have to inevitably come across these two characteristics that define public goods from private goods and that is excludability and rival uh, in nature. So, uh, whether uh, education can be considered as a private good or not, it has to be examined in against these two characteristics of excludability and rivalrousness. So, access to education can be excluded, can be restricted based on various criteria such as ability to pay tuition fees or meeting specific entry requirements in a program. For example, private schools and universities charge fees which means that only those who can afford to pay can access these services. So, it is very uh, obvious that education can be excludable. So, it does not meet the public good criteria of non-excludability. Now, what about rivalrousness? In some contexts, education can be rivalrous. For example, when a classroom reaches its capacity, adding more students can reduce the quality of education each student receives because of it being getting overcrowded and there can be limited teacher attention and stretched resources. So, if we 
place education against these two uh, unique characteristics of public good, excludability and rivalness, we see that it does not meet these two characteristics. So, yes, education can be considered as a private good. But education generates positive externalities and positive externalities from education can spill over national boundaries to other nations in the form of transmission of knowledge. And because it has uh, different kinds of positive externalities, the nature of positive externalities emerging from education can be um, immediately impacting others who are uh, located in the vicinity of a person who is educated. For example, a very educated person in a remote village of this country or a very educated person in a peri-urban area in this country, in a slum area of this uh, region can immediately impact the neighborhood or the community uh, in uh, many different ways. So, in that sense, personal education of a person has uh, neighborhood effects as far as the community is concerned as well as per education of individuals in a large scale has uh, uh, social impacts as far as the country as a whole is concerned and also it can uh, spill over national boundaries. So, in that sense, education has huge positive externalities and therefore, it is uh, fine to argue that the market on its own will fail to generate a socially desirable outcome because externalities can create substantial amount of gap between private demand and social demand. And there is an element of non-rivalry in consumption in the sense that educated individuals generate positive externalities for society. So, while we have just seen that education can be identified as a private good because uh, of it being rivalrous in nature, we have we can also see that there are non-rival characteristics embedded within education because of its uh, because of it providing uh, huge positive externalities that impact positively the society as a whole. So, can we then classify education based on this understanding alone? While resorting to an economic classification of education, we need to distinguish among these three layers, primary, secondary and higher education which I have just mentioned. But for the sake of today's class, we will focus our attention only on the issue of higher education. So, what are the challenges to classifying higher education? Now, if we classify education in terms of private, public or merit good, we have to consider the debate on education from a very narrow perspective which is also referred to as a teleological perspective by focusing only on government intervention. If we understand that higher education has huge positive externalities which impacts community at large, which impacts society at large, countries which also has the capacity to spill over uh, national boundaries, then is it appropriate to simply talk about higher education in the context of classifying them as what kind of a good or we need to go beyond that. So, there are many challenges to such a classification. For example, a higher education produces multiple outputs like teaching and research both by public and private institutions and higher education also undergoes transformation changing its character and nature. Now, while these uh, characteristics exist, education if we have to consider education as an economic good, it has to be studied and understood from the perspective of economic theory. So, then the question still remains that what kind of a good or service higher education is. Technically speaking, higher education is identified as a mixed good or a quasi public good uh, following various economists over the years. Uh, the term quasi public good is also uh, used quite often in the theory of uh, externalities and public goods and so on. And if you can recall from the last class and in the lesson one of this week where we discussed about degree of excludability and degree of uh, non-rivalness of different goods and services, we can actually consider quasi public goods somewhere in between public and private goods. And quasi public goods are also known as impure public goods because they possess some but not all the characteristics of a pure public goods. They are partially excludable and also partially rivalrous meaning that they do not fully meet the criteria for being non-excludable and non-rivalrous. So, what are the key characteristics of a quasi public good? Just for the sake of uh, uh, giving a definition to what are quasi public goods and there will be if uh, an interested learner in the area of public economics can actually find uh, the definitional uh, characteristics of quasi public goods useful for many other uh, analysis as well. 
So, the very first characteristic is that of partial excludability. Access to quasi-public goods can be restricted to some extent. For example, toll roads can be used only by those who pay the toll, but they are still available to a broad section of the public. Similarly, public parks may require entry fees or membership for certain facilities. So, partial excludability can be applicable to quasi-public goods and often it is profitable in the short run as well as in the long run to be able to apply the rule of partial excludability for quasi-public goods and it has got to do a lot with how these uh, quasi-public goods need to be provisioned. Uh, it is one thing about producing uh, economic goods, uh, they may be private goods or public goods, but then the provisioning of these quasi-public goods becomes a very important economic decision. And these are some of the ways in which uh, quasi-public goods can be financed by implementing the rule of partial excludability. Similarly, quasi-public goods also qualify the uh, characteristic of partial rivalry. They can become rivalrous when consumption reaches a certain level. For example, a popular beach may have ample space for visitors most of the time, which in that sense it is non-rivalrous, but it can become crowded during peak times, reducing the enjoyment for each visitor, which means that it becomes rivalrous. And uh, to be able to um, uh, restrict the non-rivalrous nature of uh, quasi-public good, again, some kind of a user fee can be imposed on people. Uh, which uh, can qualify as a form of financing of the quasi-public good. These goods also have uh, positive externalities, they generate benefits that extend beyond the individual consumer and to society as a whole. For instance, education provides personal benefits to the student but also social benefits through educated workforce and lower crime rates. Uh, finally, uh, this uh, quasi-public goods also uh, address the uh, characteristic of congestibility. They are subject to congestion effects, meaning that their quality or availability can diminish as more people use them. For instance, public transportation systems can handle a large number of users, but overcrowding during rush hours can decrease the quality of services and similar kinds of analogies can also be placed on quality of learning and teaching. And uh, because the quality of learning and teaching can deteriorate by mindlessly increasing quantity of institutions or quantity of students without attention to maintaining student teacher ratios or providing uh, learning materials, providing infrastructure and so on and so forth. So, therefore, uh, educational institutions, even healthcare institutions can qualify as uh, quasi-public goods. But healthcare institutions, because they have a direct impact on the life of an individual, uh, will stand higher in comparison to education or basic education in the list of quasi-public goods. Now, another important aspect to higher education is citizens' demand for higher education and the importance of citizens' demand for higher education can never be underestimated. So, it is uh, a private good with huge positive externalities which accrue to the society as a whole and this line drawn between public and private goods in case of higher education is thin and shifting depending upon the policy environment of the country within which we are arguing. It is also argued that uh, one has to go beyond an economist's obsession of categorizing higher education as a public good or one may look at uh, sidestep the efficiency conditions and appeal to the importance of citizens' demand for higher education and hence it can be defined as a public good. In one of the earlier classes while discussing about millions of children are not learning the uh, paper by Roser, we uh, discussed that uh, there are poorer countries of the world are uh, spending more on primary education, um, are spending out of pocket uh, more on primary education and secondary education than on higher education, whereas uh, developed countries of the world are spending more on higher education and less on primary education, which means that it is the governments provide, governments invest more on basic education, primary education and secondary education such that the uh, returns to education is uh, high and also the developed countries of the world have reached a position because of the public investment on basic education and primary education as a result of which the households have become capable in spending on their own on higher education. 
Uh, whereas in unequal countries such as Brazil, we had seen that returns to higher education is very high. The premium placed on returns to higher education is very high because the uh, share of population that is accessing higher education is very low. The households are spending more on primary education and as well as on higher education. But all of these discussions uh, highlight the fact that uh, in today's world when education inequalities at the macro level have gone down, more and more people are getting educated, more and more people are getting enrolled in education institutions, citizens demand for higher education is also very high and that is a demand, uh, this demand for higher education, demand for knowledge can not be underestimated by the budgetary process or political process and therefore governments have to pay attention to uh, the demand for higher education and accordingly spend on higher education. So, the task of categorizing higher education as a quasi-public good, public good or private good is actually very delicate, subjective and often even emotional and it has important policy implications. Now, there are of course various approaches in economics to look at financing of education and health. And the standard neoclassical approach uh, shows that there are difficulties of categorizing higher education as public or private good. In fact, most of the discussions surrounding externalities and public goods, private goods following Professor Sam, uh, no, Samuelson that we have studied in the last class actually uh, informs us about the neoclassical tradition. Uh, now, why is it difficult to classify higher education as public or private good? This is not only because uh, teaching and research are the two major components of higher education, but both public and private institutions are involved in the production of output or both public and private institutions are actively involved in the provisioning of uh, higher education. So, it not only depends on uh, the ownership but the underlying policy framework which governs the production of this output is also very important. And the challenge is to define or classify something that does not depend on the market alone but which involves general public and political uh, processes. Now, while we are paying a lot of attention to classifying higher education into these boxes of public good, private good and so on, we also need to understand why such a classification is important in the first place. It is important to identify higher education as a good or service because we have to deal with the big question of mode of financing higher education and because financing of higher education has to be done by someone. Either it has to be done by the government, by the private sector or by the, the financing has to be done by the government or by the households. Uh, so, pricing of higher education and the extent of subsidization is based on our understanding of this basic question of classification. So, therefore, we uh, continue to ask the same question, is higher education a public good, a mixed good or a merit good? Now, in order for higher education to qualify as a pure public good, we know that it has to satisfy the two characteristics of non-rivalry in consumption and non-excludability. And we have seen since the beginning of this lesson, strictly speaking, that higher education actually fails to satisfy both of these criteria. Because often eligibility requirements are needed to be complied and credential certificates are given to successful candidates who pass exams. So, which means that rivalry in admissions and exclusion can be easily enforceable for higher education. Many economists have argued higher education to be an experience good which means that true assessment depends on the experience as they undergo rigorous process of attending classes and interacting with the faculty and peers and ultimately uh, as they face the job market and society. Often university spaces are highlighted as important public institutions or public spaces. Uh, because although they are rival in nature because eligibility criteria decides whether or not they can enter into these educational spaces and institutions, but it is uh, generally uh, felt and understood that these university spaces provide an experience to the students to be able to um, interact with their peer, to be able to interact with uh, faculty uh, who have spent uh, uh, long years of time in different education institutions and therefore university spaces are also considered as uh, knowledge spaces and to use a very restrictive view of uh, university spaces, we can also call it as uh, the production of knowledge that takes place within these university spaces. There is an extensive literature in the area of um, 
universities as spaces of learning and thinking and I would encourage learners to look up uh, scholars such as Martha Nussbaum and others who have extensively written in this uh, area. Economists such as Stiglitz uh, consider education as a publicly provided private good because education is rival and excludable and seats are limited in educational institutions, particularly in privately funded ones. So education can be bought and sold in the market just like any other uh, private good. Now, so we have in a way sorted this uh, question. Uh, that uh, higher education falls somewhere at the intersection of public and private goods, they are quasi-public goods, some may call it as mixed uh, goods uh, and uh, there are both publicness and privateness characteristics uh, associated with the production of knowledge as far as higher education is concerned. But what are these privateness and publicness characteristics that we are talking about? There are many but there are some that we can think of uh, based upon the materials that I am sharing with you. So private goods can be produced in higher education. Now what are these private goods that are produced from higher education? Uh, one of the first things that is uh, often discussed is what is called individualized status. Individualized status benefits or positional goods and credentials which depend on the brand of the institutions. Often we look at the brand of the institutions or the quality of institutions um, depending upon various uh, factors, uh, quality of institutions are uh, ranked, we look at ranking of institutions and so on. because. Uh, once we get enrolled into these institutions, there is an individualized status that becomes a byproduct or that becomes an outcome of being enrolled into these institutions. These are referred to as positional goods. So individual status benefits that uh, is an outcome because of my enrollment in a higher education institution which, uh, which is highly ranked or which is uh, branded as a good institution can lead to my status as a positional good. So in that sense, it is a production of a private good characteristic of higher education. So leaders of institutions are often driven by the status as they seek to improve and raise the status of their institutions. So we can say that higher education institutions produce status and this production of status is the private good characteristic of the output that is produced in higher education institutions. Often higher education institutions compete with other institutions to attract the best students and the faculty by virtue of being prestigious institutions. So in that sense, they muster social power in the process. Uh, there is an association of social power as far as uh, higher education institutions are concerned, the quality higher education institutions, higher education institutions that are able to attract uh, good faculty, good students, uh, uh, good resources that itself shows that it has some influence in the process of hiring because it musters social power. And that is also the publicness characteristic of the production of knowledge of higher education institutions. So educational credentials play a role in social selection and the distribution of individual benefits as private goods. There are uh, extensive research being carried out in this uh, uh, area of uh, role in social selection and the distribution of individual benefits, how uh, credentials from uh, quality higher education institutions can have returns uh, with respect to incomes but also returns with respect to social status, the returns with respect to social relations uh, that one forges within a society is also an important uh, outcome of uh, getting associated with quality higher education institutions. Now social status is something which is uh, privately consumed by the individual. So in that sense, uh, this is a private good which is coming from the production of knowledge of higher education institutions. Similarly, values are generated which are subject to both rivalry and excludability even when education is free and state provided. Even if education is free and state provided, but uh, my uh, getting uh, well educated might and if I am able to have the capacity to uh, stay in education for a longer period of time, the returns to education that I get in the long run are individualized benefits. It adds to my individualized status benefits 
benefits, the produce status, I can influence uh, my uh, community, the society at large with my social power in the process, I can forge social relations and social connections. So in that sense, there is immense value that is generated from higher education and this is rival as well as excludable in nature. These, uh, the social power associated with my uh, presence in society because of being higher educated is that that value is being consumed by myself. So in that sense, there are private goods produced in higher education. Now, there are of course uh, public goods also that are produced in higher education and often uh, we have uh, discussed uh, this in various, uh, in the context of the various lessons that we have done so far. Now, whether it is marketized or not, higher education does produce public goods. Knowledge is a classic example of public good. Say there is a mathematical formula that has been formulated and it is in public domain. Once uh, formulated, it is and should be used by everyone else. Once knowledge has been uh, disseminated in public domain, it can and should be used by everyone. So in that sense, knowledge is a classic example of a public good and this is a public good produced in higher education. Knowledge can only be temporarily excludable in a networked environment, but often uh, it does have the capacity to spill over different kinds of boundaries, whether it is boundaries of the institutions within which knowledge has been produced uh, or it is from within the boundaries of uh, national boundaries or different communities within which knowledge has been produced. Now, uh, we also talk about uh, the structure of social opportunity that higher education provides. The social opportunity that higher education provides is an example of public good. So, uh, higher education institutions may or may not be able to provide you an uh, employment, may or may not be able to provide me a direct source of employment, but it does empower me to have to gain social opportunities. So in that sense, the amount of social opportunity that I get uh, after being higher educated is a form of a public good that has come about because of the process of creation of knowledge in higher education institutions. So structure of social opportunity is an example of public good that is provided by higher education institutions. Often we have seen that equitable access is under provided by market, by the free markets and therefore affirmative action irrespective of number of seats generates a public good and what is this public good? This is fairness. When we talk about fairness and justice, affirmative actions uh, that are implemented in higher education institutions uh, create an enabling environment for various uh, sections of the population. So in that sense it generates the, uh, so it generates social opportunity by providing fair rules for everyone. So in that sense it is a public good that higher education provides. There is also an aspect of private good which is access to scarce high ranking institutions because uh, these qualify the uh, excludability and rivalness nature of uh, private goods. So um, there are private goods as well as public goods that are produced in higher education and uh, therefore then uh, they uh, technically speaking they are quasi public goods, we can call them as impure public goods. Uh, but uh, there are uh, various scholars uh, or various economists carry out various kinds of analysis given the context where higher education when produced um, by private sector, higher education produced by the public sector. Uh, through the intervention of government, uh, what are the returns on investment, what is the scale of education, whether there is economies of scale uh, with respect to the costs incurred on higher education. These are all very uh, important questions and uh, needs to be investigated and interrogated within the larger framework of research in higher education. Now, let us move on to this very important uh, uh, debate on whether higher education can be considered as a merit good and there is a debate in this and um, in the last class we have been introduced to this concept of the merit good where we saw that a merit good, the conceptualization of merit good is different from that of public and private goods because when we say public and private goods, we of course look at the characteristics of those goods but a private good may be a merit good by virtue of the fact that it is socially desirable or it has huge externalities, positive externalities and it can uh, impact large sections of the population. So uh, there are a lot of debate in this area. In fact, in the context of India in the 1990s, 
there was a debate with respect to investments in higher education and whether the government should spend more on higher education in uh, sciences and engineering or the government should spend more on humanities and social sciences and there was a debate and an argument with respect to uh, there was a white paper which considered the sciences education as a merit good whereas humanities and social sciences education is a non-merit good and these were highly debated and there is an extensive literature surrounding this uh, debate and these are some of the questions that has uh, brought the limelight into whether higher education should be considered as a merit good and not just higher education within higher education what is it that should be considered as a merit good. So, uh, in this uh, class uh, we will not go into the specifics of different kinds of education within higher education and whether or not they are considered as merit good. I will only focus on what is the economist's view with regard to whether higher education should be considered as a merit good. So, this debate about higher education being a merit good in economics basically involves contrasting views from two economists, James Buchanan and Richard Musgrave. In the last class you saw that Richard Musgrave initiated this idea of the merit good and the concept is basically that merit goods are goods that the government believes should be available to all regardless of individual willingness or ability to pay and higher education from the view of Richard Musgrave uh, tells us that it is often considered a merit good because it is believed to provide benefits not just to individuals but also to society at large. Now, of course, there are positive externalities which is why it is considered as a merit good. So, Musgrave argues that higher education generates positive externalities such as a more informed and skilled workforce leading to high productivity, economic growth and so on and these benefits justify government intervention and funding. There is this view of equity and access ensuring that higher education is accessible to all individuals regardless of their socioeconomic status promotes the idea of equity and government funding and subsidies can help overcome financial barriers and ensure that talented individuals from all backgrounds can access higher education and this is something that we discuss in the context of affirmative action or reservation in the context of Indian uh, education system and so on. And of course, these are all debatable issues requiring uh, discussions from uh, various angles, but uh, this is uh, in a nutshell what we discuss with respect to equity and access and whether or not we should consider higher education as a merit good. What is James Buchanan's view on this? Uh, James Buchanan is a key figure in public choice theory and he emphasizes the role of individual choice and potential inefficiencies and unintended consequences of government intervention. He is of the view that if governments intervene in the provision of uh, a higher education which is a private good and it should be provided by the market is what uh, is Buchanan's view, then it leads to some kind of distortion within the market. So, he says that market mechanisms are best suited, he argues that individuals are better judges of their own needs and that market mechanisms should determine the allocation of resources because they are best suited to do so and he is skeptical of the government's ability to correctly identify and fund merit goods without political biases and inefficiencies. And these are all credible views uh, within the discipline of education economics that scholars work on and there are different uh, writings and uh, different uh, research conducted in these views and I would encourage learners to look at all of these views uh, to be able to understand comprehensively or holistically this uh, debate on higher education as a merit good. Opportunity costs and individual preferences is another uh, aspect of uh, that Buchanan focuses on. So, he highlights the opportunity costs of government spending on higher education. He suggests that these resources can ideally be spent elsewhere. So, he believes individuals should have the freedom to allocate their resources based on preferences and the government intervention might distort these choices. So, he goes on to explain that you know as individuals we have our own choices to make with respect to demand for higher education and although governments are spending so much on higher education there may not be too many takers. So, if there are not too many takers what is the point of spending all of those resources on higher education because then the opportunity cost is very high and those resources could have been spent elsewhere. So, these are the key points of the contrasting views between Musgrave and Buchanan. First is with respect to role of government. 
Musgrave advocates for substantial government intervention to correct market failures and ensure equitable access to higher education, whereas Buchanan is skeptical of government intervention, emphasizing the potential for inefficiencies and importance of individual choices. With regard to externalities and public benefits, Musgrave emphasizes the positive externalities of higher education and the broader societal benefits. Buchanan questions the extent and significance of these externalities, suggesting that individuals should be free to decide the value of higher education. Uh, there is the debate with regard to equity versus efficiency. Musgrave prioritizes equity and social benefits of providing higher education to all and therefore advocates for subsidies and government funding. Buchanan focuses on efficiency and potential drawbacks of government intervention and thus this theory advocates for market-based solutions. Now, so far uh, we have progressed in this lesson by um, engaging ourselves with this question, is uh, higher education a public good or a quasi-public good or a merit good? And so far and by now we uh, have some answers to this question. We uh, do understand that strictly speaking, higher education can be considered at the intersection of public and private goods because they are definitely goods which uh, qualify the characteristics of uh, excludability and rivalness in nature. They can be excluded and they can be rival in nature, but they also have huge positive externalities that spill over to various other beneficiaries and in that sense they have public characteristics and therefore economists term them as quasi-public goods or mixed goods. Uh, we also ask the question with regard to whether it is a merit good. It is a merit good, at least higher education is considered as a merit good because it has huge uh, externalities particularly in terms of social opportunities and production of knowledge. There is also a, a broad view with regard to the global characteristic of higher education and often it is also termed as a global public good. When we consider the uh, externalities arising out of higher education transcending national boundaries and uh, knowledge which is utilized by other countries. Uh, in uh, uh, science and technology, in for example, disaster management techniques and so on and so forth, they can be considered as global public good. Information systems, uh, early warning systems, these are all production of knowledge that is coming from higher education and these transcend national boundaries. So, in this sense, uh, higher education is considered as a global public good. So, some economists argue that higher education should be viewed as a global public good due to its widespread societal benefits and the role of research in addressing global challenges. Institutions like the United Nations and World Bank often emphasize the global public good aspect of higher education and therefore they advocate for international cooperation and funding. There is a hybrid view also where many economists recognize that higher education has both private and public good characteristics and therefore this view supports the idea of mixed funding models where both private uh, tuition fees based and public or government subsidies based contributions are necessary to ensure equitable access and societal benefits. Let us now come to the third uh, part of this lesson where we discuss about, uh, we have so far discussed about higher education as a commodity. Uh, where uh, it is an economic good, it is an economic good which can be traded in the market, but there are certain inefficiencies that creep in because of externalities and therefore some amount of correction is required with regard to by the budgetary process of allocation, distribution and stabilization and this is something that we have understood. But while it is an economic good and a commodity, uh, it has also excessive obsession with provision of uh, uh, higher education through the market process has also given rise to the concept of commoditization of higher education. And I think while we are talking about um, while we are talking about higher education as uh, from the economist's lens of public goods and private goods, and uh, because these are all uh, areas which requires some interdisciplinary focus, we must uh, also discuss this issue of commoditization and what does commoditization of higher education mean and what are the implications of it. So, commoditization of higher education refers to the process by which higher education is increasingly treated as a commercial product or service rather than as a public good or a societal investment. So, this shift involves viewing education primarily through the lens of market dynamics where institutions compete for students and resources and students are seen as consumers. 
So, what are the important um, aspects of commoditization? One of the important aspect that I uh, feel needs uh, emphasis is market driven approaches. Higher education institutions in the context of commoditization, uh, when we say that higher education is being commoditized or commoditization of higher education institutions, what we mean is that higher education institutions start operating more like businesses. They focus on marketing, branding and customer satisfaction to attract and retain students. There is increased competition among institutions leading to strategies aimed at differentiating their offerings and maximizing enrollment. Uh, the second aspect is with respect to tuitions and fees. Education becomes a product that students purchase with tuitions and fees representing the price of the service. And then institutions may increase tuitions to generate revenue leading to higher student debt and financial burden. Um, the third important aspect is uh, commoditization of higher education looks at student as a consumer. Students are treated as consumers who demand value for their investment expecting quality education facilities and services and institutions respond by enhancing amenities, expanding course offerings and improving campus life to attract and satisfy students. And often uh, commoditization of higher education leads to standardization and mass production. Uh, in classroom teachings uh, where uh, education is publicly funded with a focus on creative uh, thinking and learning, often uh, um, teachers bring their own experiences, uh, bring the community experiences to the classroom uh, which is appreciated by uh, um, students or learners uh, within classroom environments. But when there is commoditization of higher education, it leads to some kind of standardization where uh, uh, community experience gets lost in the world of uh, standardization of uh, rules and regulations and techniques and technologies that needs to be incorporated within uh, the idea of production of knowledge. So, educational programs then may become more standardized to achieve economies of scale because there need to be takers. Remember in the context of commoditization of higher education, we are looking at students as consumers. So, then if students become customers, then uh, the, the demand for education is such that it has marketability or it has market uh, uh, implications or market uh, usefulness, utility in the market. So, therefore, then standardization is becomes desirable and uh, to achieve economies of scale and that will potentially lead to a reduction in personalized and diverse learning experiences. In fact, the online education and massive open online courses are also examples of commoditization of how education is scaled up to reach larger audiences often at a lower cost and uh, these are all uh, new areas of research within the stream of higher education and it requires further research to be able to understand the implications of these courses uh, in the context of this discussion of higher education as merit good, massification, commodification and so on. So, what are the implications of uh, commoditization of higher education? One of the first aspects that needs highlighting is quality and access. While commoditization can and does lead to improved infrastructure and services, it may also result in a focus on profitability over educational quality. And often there is a struggle to find a balance between profitability and educational quality. In fact, most of the higher education institutions globally are privatized higher education, are private institutions without compromising, without largely compromising on the quality of education produced. So, it will be wrong to say that privatization always leads to compromises in the quality of education. It may not be so, but there has to be a right balance between profitability and education quality. Access to higher education may become more dependent on students ability to pay and therefore, it intensifies already existing inequalities, structural inequalities within society, particularly in societies which has not been built upon years of public investment in primary education and secondary education. The uh, spending on uh, increased privatized spending on higher education can uh, lead to um, intensifying inequalities, particularly in a society where the aspirations for higher education is very high and the return on investment on higher education is very high. 
Now that brings us to the second important concept of focus on return on investment. In the context of commoditization, the focus is more on ROI or the return on investment. So the value of education is increasingly measured by the returns such as job placement rates, starting salaries of graduates, etc. And this emphasis on financial outcomes can overshadow the broader process of education such as critical thinking, civic engagement, personal growth and so on. There can also be pressure on faculty and staff. Faculty may face pressures to increase productivity, engage in more research and adapt to new teaching methods to meet market demands. Uh, job security and academic freedom can be compromised as institutions prioritize marketability and financial sustainability. There is an aspect of globalization and international competition in the context of commoditization because HEIs compete globally for students, faculty and research funding leading to international marketing efforts and partnerships and this global competition can drive innovation and improvements but they may also contribute to the commercialization of education. There can also be a shift in institutional priorities. Institutions, even public institutions, may start prioritizing programs and disciplines that are more marketable and have higher demand. And this can potentially neglect the arts, humanities and other fields with perceptibly low immediate economic returns. And the focus on revenue generation can influence the mission and values of educational institutions. Now, this uh, issue of commoditization of higher education is a very important area of discussion. There are many scholars who have contributed to this uh, discussion and it is not uh, possible for us to be able to confine a lot of scholars within uh, this discussion. But since we are discussing about commoditization and massification of education, we must also understand that there is an extensive and uh, critique of massification of education. And uh, while we are talking about the advantages of uh, privatization of education or we are looking at balances between uh, privatization and public provision of education, we must also bear in mind the critique of massification of education. Uh, and there are a few uh, important uh, points that I would like to highlight in this lesson. Much of these points I have uh, gathered from uh, readings uh, by the renowned uh, linguist and philosopher and thinker uh, Noam Chomsky. So, in the context of critique of massification of education, one of the first points that he highlights is about commercialization and corporatization. So, Chomsky argues that massification of education often leads to commercialization and corporatization because it tends to prioritize market values and profit motives over educational values and public good. So, he criticizes the influence of corporate interests on educational institutions which can actually shift the focus from critical thinking and knowledge creation to vocational training and market driven research. Second, quality of education, the emphasis on expanding access and increasing enrollment can sometimes lead to a dilution of education quality. Chomsky is concerned that the massification of education can result in standardized, less personalized education, uh, larger class sizes, overburdened faculty and so on. He also argues that true education should focus on developing critical thinking, creativity, intellectual engagement and so on. Uh, there is extensive literature on this uh, aspect of increasing student debt and financial burden. Chomsky highlights the growing issue of student debt as a consequence of massification and commercialization and he sees the increasing reliance on tuition fees and loans as a way to shift the financial burden onto students and their families which can then often restrict them in uh, actively participating in civic life and the political process of nation building. So, he believes that this trend undermines the principle of education as a public good, intensifying social and economic inequalities. With respect to neoliberal policies, uh, he links the massification of education to broader neoliberal policies that emphasize privatization, deregulation and market mechanism, which basically highlights the economic ideology which requires uh, the deregulation of the social sector. A stepping back of the state from providing social security services and increased privatization of the social sector. So, he argues that these policies undermine the role of education as a tool for social mobility and democratic participation and in the process criticizes the reduction of public funding for education and the push towards privatization because he believes it leads to a two-tiered education system that benefits the wealthy and disadvantages the poor. 
There is also an impact on faculty and academic freedom. Massification can impact faculty leading to job insecurity. If you do not adhere to the market principles of providing different kinds of education, increased workloads and reduced academic freedom. And there is a concern about corporatization of universities which prioritizes administrative and financial goals over academic and intellectual goals. And he also argues that this environment can stifle critical inquiry and limit the ability of faculty to challenge dominant ideologies and engage in transformative education. So, in the third part of this lesson, we uh, learnt about uh, commoditization of education, what are the important aspects of commoditization and what is the debate surrounding commoditization of education. Commoditization leads to massification of education and we discuss some of the basic ideas surrounding massification of education. Now, we will move to the last part of this lesson where I want to highlight some of the theoretical frameworks in economics that address the issue of financing in higher education. Remember that in this module on concept of externalities, when we are discussing the fiscal policy of budgetary processes, when we are discussing different goods and services, one of the reasons, one of the implications of looking at these different boxes of public-private distinctions is to understand how financing takes place or who finances higher education and there is a lot of debate uh, on this but in uh, this uh, part of the lesson I will only highlight some of the frameworks that uh, as economists we uh, use as a conceptualization to understand uh, how financing should take place. The first one is frequently discussed one and I have also extensively covered in this course which is the theory of human capital um, the developed by Gary Becker, Jacob Mincer, Theodore Schulz and others which views that education is an investment in human capital similar to investments in physical capital and individuals invest in education to increase their productivity and earnings. Now, what are the implications of financing? That there should be private investments, individuals should finance their education through personal savings, loans or income sharing arrangements as they will reap the private benefits in the form of higher wages. There may be public support, human capital theory does advocate for public support but most of the funding or financing should happen uh, through the private uh, resources. Government intervention is justified in the human capital theory to correct market failures, provide information and ensure access especially for those who cannot afford the upfront costs. The second framework is that of what we have been discussing so far, public goods and externalities. This theory associated with economists like Samuelson and Musgrave emphasizes the positive externalities of higher education such as increased innovation, civic engagement and economic growth and they have implications for public funding, subsidies and grants. Government funding uh, based on this framework is necessary to support higher education because of its public good characteristics and spillover benefits to society and public subsidies, grants and scholarships are important tools to make higher education accessible and equitable. The third framework is what is referred to as income contingent loans. These are proposed by economists like Milton Friedman and further developed by Nicholas Barr and others. And these income contingent loans are basically a mechanism where students borrow to finance their education and repay the loan based on their future income. These are theoretical framework based upon which student loans are designed and devised and implemented. And there are implications for financing. This basically is based upon the idea of uh, risk sharing. So, the income contingent loans reduce the financial risk for students as repayments are proportional to their income providing a safety net for low on earners. But the risk of uh, income contingent loans is basically the fact that we are talking about economies which are functioning um, without disruptions. And if unemployment becomes an important disruption in the economy or recession becomes an important disruption in the economy, then the income contingent loans uh, or the financial risk that the students bear for uh, getting their education can become a huge burden on them. Equity and access, it is uh, advocated that uh, ICLs or income contingent loans can improve access to higher education by allowing students to pay according to their financial capacity after graduation. So, the collateral uh, that is paid on the student loans is not your current uh, uh, status of education or your current uh, physical capital, but uh, your uh, future uh, status as human capital, the durability of your human capital becomes the collateral in the uh, short run. 
there is uh, a theoretical framework with respect to Baumol's cost disease, which is formulated by William Baumol and William Bowen. They suggest that the cost of labor intensive services like education tends to rise faster than other sectors due to slow productivity growth. And this can have implications for financing because there are rising costs of education. The increasing costs of higher education necessitate greater public and private funding to maintain quality and access. And uh, therefore, uh, institutions need to adopt uh, measures to improve efficiency and manage costs without compromising education quality. There is also a view uh, with respect to economics of information and this theory associated with economists like Ekerloff and others that we have discussed uh, in the context of uh, health insurance and they focus on information asymmetries in education markets where uh, students may lack information about the quality and value of different education programs and therefore then it has implications for financing because government intervention becomes necessary to provide information, regulate quality and ensure transparency to help students make informed choices. And financial aid or uh, targeted financial aid can then help address information asymmetries by guiding students towards high quality, high return educational opportunities. And then finally, there are cost sharing models. These are advocated by economists like Bruce Chapman that involve sharing the cost of higher education between the government, students and families. So this proposes a balanced approach uh, to financing higher education, combining tuition fees, public subsidies and financial aid to ensure sustainability and access keeping in mind equity considerations. So, they, they need to be properly designed these cost sharing mechanisms and can enhance equity by ensuring financial contributions are based on ability to pay and that financial aid is available for those in need. So, um, we come to the uh, final uh, framework that uh, informs financing in education which is vouchers and education saving accounts. This is also inspired by Milton Friedman's ideas where vouchers and education savings accounts are mechanisms that give students and families direct control over public funding for education. And these tools uh, introduce market dynamics into higher education by allowing students to choose their preferred institutions, promoting competition, efficiency and so on. So what we have done today is we have uh, asked this question with regard to higher education that whether they qualify as public goods, quasi public goods or merit goods and we have ample evidences to see that they lie at the intersection of public and private goods, they are mixed goods or quasi public goods. They also have merit characteristics because they have huge social opportunities, there are uh, positive externalities that arise out of these goods and therefore uh, justification of government intervention in some aspect is well taken or it is justified. But we have also seen that um, there are associated issues of uh, financing. So, we are not just concerned, the economist's job is not just to be concerned about to put higher education into which box, but also to understand that uh, there are uh, huge implications for financing of higher education. And in today's world where uh, we are talking about minding the fiscal deficit, where we are talking about restriction of resources, uh, so it becomes a bit of a fight with regard to where should we uh, spend on. And when I say where we should spend on, it refers to the government spending processes as well as the household spending processes. So, there are inflationary pressures within the economy. So, often it is a matter of individual and public choice with regard to whether we spend more on higher education or not and therefore the role of the governments become very important. It is in this context that we talk about the the downsides of massification of education and the dilution of education that takes place because of commoditization and massification and the need to balance both of these extremes of uh, education as knowledge creation, education as creation of minimum and knowledge capabilities and education as uh, creation of skills uh, that uh, is required by the market. There has to be a proper balance between both of these which is what we uh, discussed in the context of massification. And finally, uh, we looked at some of the important economic uh, uh, theoretical frameworks that can guide us to understand this emerging and uh, very extensive area of research of uh, uh, higher education and its uh, publicness and privateness characteristics. For this lesson, I have extensively used uh, two uh, textbooks. One 
uh, titled Education and Economics, Disciplinary Evolution and Policy a Discourse by Somain Chottopadhyay and I have used the book by JBG Tilak on Higher Education, Public Goods and Markets. I have also uh, studied uh, some of the papers by Noam Chomsky which is readily available on online and I would also encourage uh, the learners to refer to uh, some of these writings. So, uh, with this I end this class, thank you. Mm -hmm.